some of the chants we recite in the evening are meant to inspire us, and others are meant to keep us grounded, to make sure that we don't get lost in abstractions, get lost in ideas that are not all that relevant to where we are, like the chant on the requisites. It's there to remind us day in, day out. So when you're born, you're born with a big lack. You've got this body that needs food, needs clothing, needs shelter, needs medicine. And you're not born with an entitlement to those things. If you're really entitled to them, they would come on their own. The fact that they do seem to come on their own when we're a child is because our parents are out looking after, looking after us. But that means they have to go out and do extra work just to provide for this big gaping hole they've just given birth to. And so as you grow up as a human being, you not only carry this huge load of needs around with you, but you also carry a big debt to the goodness, the, the work of other people. And so it's important to keep that in mind. Part of the reason for that chant is to give us a sense of sangwega. You think about all the suffering that goes into making sure that we have the food we need to keep this body going, the clothing, the shelter, the medicine, not only from the work that we've done ourselves to get these things, but also all the work and sacrifices that other beings make so that we can have these things. So we come to the practice with a big debt, and the Buddha encourages us to, encourage us to have a sense of gratitude for everyone who has provided for us provided for us materially, also providing for us in terms of the Dharma, because otherwise we get complacent. There's a saying that gratitude is a sign of a good person, because if you don't appreciate the goodness of other people, it's hard for you to go out and make that extra effort to be a good person yourself. So it's good to stop and reflect every day on the debts that you owe to other people and the various ways you might be able to repay those debts. So you come to the practice not with a sense of entitlement, but with a sense of how much you need the Dharma practice to compensate for the debts that you've been accumulating over time. You look at the monastery we have here. This has come through the generosity of lots and lots of different people. They've been generous with their money, generous with their time, generous with their strength. Everything we have here is the result of somebody's generosity. You can't look around and find something that belongs to the monastery that's not the result of generosity. So one of the reasons we need to be really active in the practice, dedicated to the practice, uncomplacent in the practice, is because we've got this debt. As the Buddha once said, the only people who are really debtless in this world are the arahants. As long as we haven't reached that point yet, we still have a debt to other people, other beings all around us. And so whatever way we can build goodness to with through generosity in our, of our own, observing the precepts, doing the meditation, it's a way of helping to repay that debt. At the same time, keeping this teaching alive. We have to have a sense of how precious this is, this teaching of the Dharma. It's not that beings are born and get to meet with the Dharma every lifetime. There are whole aeons when the world has no notion of the Dharma at all. We are born in a time when the Dharma is still alive. There are still people practicing this. As the Buddha said, the world is not empty of arahants. So we've got this opportunity to have a sense of the value of the opportunity. Think of the our sense of debt of, debt of gratitude to all the people who have kept this alive. When you read Buddhist history, it's, sometimes it can be a pretty depressing project, seeing how people take the Dharma and bend it to other needs, other ideas. You know, if there are always people who have a sense of the Dharma's true, true purpose, and work to bring it, the tradition back. But you think of all the difficulties those people go through, like with a John Munn. In his days, the forest tradition had degenerated. It was mainly monks going around with reciting magical spells, selling amulets to people. 
It was a kind of business. And he took the Vinaya and combined it with the forest practice and rediscovered the practice. At that time, Thai society, had, the officials in Thai society, had decided that the way to Nirvana was closed. Nobody seemed to be going that way. And that was the official line. Then he had to prove single-handedly that it wasn't true. And you read about the hardships he went through. And so you should have a sense of gratitude for what he did so that you maintain the Dharma as well in your practice. Don't be guilty of the sort of changes in the Dharma that someone else down the line is going to have to come along and straighten out. So we come to the Dharma not with a sense of entitlement, but with a sense of how important it is and what's demanded of us to be equal to the Dharma. And it's this way that we find that our Dharma practice really starts getting results. There's a lot demanded of us, but we have a sense of conviction and a sense of the importance of the Dharma, that we're willing to make whatever efforts involved. And John Fung once told me that one of his prime motivations in practicing was he himself was born into a poor family. He didn't do well in school. He was orphaned at an early age. And as he was growing up, he just didn't have anything to show for himself as a human being. If you want to make your way in Thai society, you've got to have a lot of good connections. Well, he had no connections, and he didn't have anything else to fall back on. He realized this was his only hope for any kind of happiness was to build up the goodness that Dharma practice could provide. So he threw himself into it. And it was because of that single-mindedness that he was able to attain what he did. So as we come to the Dharma, have a strong sense of its importance and a strong sense of our need for the Dharma. Again, we come to it not because we're entitled, but because we're carrying a huge debt around. The debt we owe to our parents, the debt we owe to all these other living beings who've contributed to the fact that we now have a body and we're still alive. So many people talk about interconnectedness as a wonderful thing, but it carries a lot of debts. And trying to think about this in a way that makes you willing and happy to repay those debts, willing to repay them, and also happy that you've found a way that you can repay them. Use that as a motivation to keep your Dharma practice online. Keep yourself devoted to the Dharma practice. And that way you benefit, you get a full set of benefits that can come from the practice, and the people around you get a, a fuller sense of benefit as well.